We have a special uh, treat today in store, uh, Professor Peter Dermanuelian, my colleague, who is an Egyptologist. So I'm just going to launch uh, today's discussion and today's lecture, and then we'll, uh, for the next, the first critical segment, uh, we'll ask Peter Emanuelian to tell us all about the Egyptological perspectives on the exodus from Egypt. So, today's assignment was to read the opening chapters for the first half or so of the book of Exodus, which, of course, appropriately enough, describes the exodus uh, of the Israelites from Egypt. Right, so Exodus is two Greek words, ex, out, of, and hodos, which means road or path. So exodus is the road, path, out. Perhaps in Latin we might say exit. Exodus being Greek. Okay, so that describes the exodus from Egypt. So I've given you the outline of the first few of the chapters for today. I noticed this morning to my horror a serious typo, mea culpa, mea maxima est culpa, uh, in chapter 2, it says, Birth of Moses, flight to Egypt. It sure, of course, should say, Flight from Egypt, or Flight to Midian. Right, so, uh, right, the quality control needs to be uh, heightened here, so I, I apologize, apologize uh, for that. Anyway, seriously, so there's the outline of those opening uh, uh, chapters. The key point to begin as we look at the picture, story as a whole is to remember that the Exodus is one of the two main poles around which much of Israelite theology revolves. We already see one pole, that's the creation motif, right? That the prophets especially, in the book of Job, wisdom literature, well, book of Job anyway, will invoke God the creator. That the creation of the world by God is one uh, pole or one focal point of Israelite theology in thinking about the relationship with God we think about God, the Creator. That's manifest in the Ten Commandments. When we look at one version of the Ten Commandments, which we'll be looking at next week, uh, which is that the Sabbath day is meant to remind Israelites of God's creative work. Remember, Genesis chapter 1 ends with the Sabbath. The other pole is the Exodus from Egypt. That as Israelites contemplate God's power, or God's justice, they are to contemplate the mighty acts of God in the redemption of the Israelites from Egypt. That's not a contradiction, it's simply an alternative pole, an alternative focal point in which many biblical texts uh, see God primarily not in terms of God's creation, but primarily in terms of God's redemption. That you see in the other version of the Ten Commandments, uh, which we'll see next week, right, in which we rest on the Sabbath because the Sabbath day reminds us of the exodus from Egypt. And similarly, many of the later prophets, notably Jeremiah, right, who is referring to the Israelites after the destruction of the temple and exile to Babylonia, which was in what year class? 587, 6, right, BCE. So Jeremiah is reassuring the Judeans that there will be a return, that there will be a restoration, and part of his promise is that no longer will you... St- no longer will you talk about the power of God who took you out of the land of Egypt. You will talk about the power of God, this powerful God who took you out of the land of Babylonia. Right? This will eclipse the prior redemption, so says Jeremiah. Again, thinking that the redemption from Egypt is a, a clear focal point of Israelite thinking about God and its relationship with God. So you have these two poles. Creation, we already discussed. Exodus from Egypt. That's the motif for today, and that's what we'll be discussing. Uh, that will come up again several times over the next several weeks. The first big point to discuss is the historicity of the Exodus. Did it actually happen? So Professor Kugel, in the reading, gives you some uh, evidence and uh, discussion back and forth about, about this. And I, in my lecture notes, have assembled some of that evidence and thrown a few more things. But rather than hear myself talk on this, I'd much rather hear someone who actually knows something, right? And that is professor, our, own very professor, our own professor of Egyptology, Professor Peter Dermanuelian, right, who is an expert in all things Egyptological, and will now give us a brief discussion of the exodus from in Egypt, the exodus Egyptologically considered. Peter. I think we should have a caption contest to uh, figure out whether <laughs> the baby's coming out of the shaft or going into the shaft or what's going on. But when you talk about historicity and ground truth and what do we really know about this episode, I think the best thing to do is turn to the ultimate source of scholarly evidence, and that, of course, is Hollywood. The Lord of hosts. 
will do battle for us. Behold his mighty hand. <laughs> the waters before them, and he bars our way with fire. Let us go from this place. Men cannot fight against a god. It's better to die in battle with a god than live in shame. Praise God and bow into it! <laughs> Nothing like a little bombast on a Wednesday morning, right? <laughs> Just out of curiosity, who's seen this movie, The Ten Commandments? So most of you have not. Well, you've got some interesting viewing ahead of you. Charlton Heston, the ultimate and bombastic actor, is great too. My favorite line, Yul Brynner is playing Ramses, by the way. My favorite line in the movie is when Ramses, queen, says to him, go and bring Moses' blood back on your sword. And he says, I will to mingle with your own. <laughs> so let's get to chronology here and try to get some of the rumors out of the way if we can here is simplified Egyptian chronology you'll never need to take any of my classes if you memorize this slide and of course it's a bit superficial here but basically you have three major what we call kingdoms in Egyptian history those are the red items the old kingdom is the pyramid age middle kingdom is slightly different it's more the high point of Egyptian literature um, pharaohs are having to deal with their officials a lot more uh, democratically, shall we say. The new kingdom is the period of empire. And in between, Upper Egypt and Lower Egypt tend to collapse and fragment and fall apart and then reunite again. So that's your basic layout. If we go to the Old Kingdom, we're at 2600, 2500 BC, and just to dispel some of the readings or some of the wiki leaks or whatever you might read, the pyramids and the Israelites have nothing to do with each other. Okay, so the whole rumors about Hebrew slaves build the pyramids and all that, we can just wipe that right off the table right now. This, with buy-in to the pharaoh's legacy as a kind of a national construction project, this is all geared towards a successful afterlife for the king and thereby guaranteeing the prosperity of the nation, etc. So I have a tough time personally believing that this is slave labor. Corvée drafted, yes, maybe some of the Egyptians had better things to do, but this is a, a native Egyptian undertaking and no aliens from outer space either. <laughs> so the old kingdom's out of the way. Middle kingdom is also not part of our story, although it's always been tempting to try to draw in some of these parallels. This is a middle kingdom um, tomb painting from the middle part of the country, a site called Beni Hassan, and it shows Semitic peoples who are infiltrating in from the northeast into the delta region, and in fact they're actually going to fragment and split the country eventually and lead to the end of the middle kingdom and what's known as the Second Intermediate Period. This used to be thought of as a great invasion and the Egypt collapse, and it's the first time there's foreign rule. <coughs> Nowadays, it's a lot more gradual, and it seems that the north and the south parts of the country were still, were still interacting and trading and functioning, and it might not be quite this sort of violent overthrow that some of your earlier histories will show. But this is a very famous painting. You can see these very un-Egyptian looking peoples with Semitic dress, Semitic costumes, and hairstyles and things coming in on either tribute or trading expeditions. And uh, so that is often been brought in as evidence of this kind of cross-cultural contact. Well, eventually, these rulers of foreign lands, as they're called in Egyptian hieroglyphs, the Hyksos, are ousted from Egypt by a family of Theban princes from here who rise up and oust 
the Hyksos and send them scurrying back <coughs> to the Levant. And then the Egyptians decide, hey, this was fun, let's keep going. And so they do what is called Suesech Tashu, or broaden the borders of Egypt. And so that whole orange shaded area that you get there becomes the imperialist age in Egyptian history, the New Kingdom or Egyptian Empire. And Egypt becomes the superpower of this period, first dealing with the Hurrian kingdoms of the Mitanni, sort of in that area, later against the Hittites from Anatolia. These are the big players of the age. So for our story, then, for Exodus, who comes into play? We've ruled out the old kingdom, we've ruled out the middle kingdom. It's down to the new kingdom, and these particular pharaohs are the ones who are mentioned, and I've highlighted them in red. Ramses II, or Ramses the Great, played by Yul Brenner, or perhaps his successor, Meneptah. Now, I could cut this very short by saying there's really not a lot of evidence from the Egyptian side, and we could be done. So, so far, I've given you no, exodus, uh, no evidence for the exodus, right? And I'm not really going to come up with very much. And in fact, my whole field was in part born by people who were coming to Egypt to try archaeologically or otherwise to prove the exodus, to excavate Pithom and Ramses, to try to find these places and find proof of it. And hieroglyphs were deciphered, and eventually Egyptology developed its own issues and interests and art history and language and grammar and archaeology and, and has since sort of moved away from biblical studies in that sense. But of course, it's still a an important question. So, is there evidence historically then for Moses and how he could have been raised at court and things like that? Not impossible. But direct evidence? We don't have it. And Ramses, other than these sort of indirect connections, I can't point to anything <coughs> archaeological that will, in the Egyptian record, material culture, archaeological record, can make this link. So, there is one famous monument of this king's reign that gets mentioned time and time again. It's probably come up in your reading. And that's this one. It's called the Israel Stela of Merneptah. And this is in the Cairo Museum. And it dates to year five. It's a victory stela where he mentions different places, Ashkelon, Gezer. And Israel is the big name. And in fact, if you go there today, you may even find the, the hieroglyphs sort of circled in white chalk for all the tour guides who don't read hieroglyphs, but bring their groups and say, look, there's the Israel Stela, and there the Israelites are mentioned. So here it is in hieroglyphs, and that actually says in syllabic orthography, Yisrael. The interesting thing here is at the end, and maybe if I go off camera for a second, you'll see a seated man and a seated woman at the back there, and three plural strokes, our screen is sort of cutting down. So this refers to a people or a tribe. So a seated man, a seated woman, like that, and then plural strokes that we're dealing with a lot of people. If you're dealing with a place name, you would get a different sign at the end of the word, which is basically looking at a traffic intersection straight down. You're looking at the intersection of two streets. So when I talk about countries or cities or towns, you get that determinative, as it's called. It's a picture element that's helping clarify or determine the name. So you'll notice that Israel is not a country. It's not a state in this text. It's a people. It's a tribe. It's a group. And they're listed as being defeated. But that's all there is. There is nothing else to go on here. You do have to ask yourself, if Exodus happened, would the Egyptians have recorded it? Do we really expect to be looking for a source and saying, and then I, Pharaoh, got screwed. <laughs> and there were plagues, and I didn't know what to do, and you know, I just let them go. Obviously, you're not going to find that in the Egyptian sources. They're not in the habit of posting information about defeats or problems. And in fact, we have to read between the lines in many cases to try to <coughs> reconstruct, is this a historical event we're reading about, or is this a topos, is this one king trying to say, I'm the golden age, you know, before me there was chaos and I made it right, or is everything in the old days great, or is everything in the old days bad? So historicity becomes a really <coughs> fascinating topic for debate. So those two kings, that's about it. There's not much in terms of real evidence that I can point to. And of course, the Egyptian sources are pretty silent. So, so I'll just leave you with one other rather provocative author, something to think about here. Um, this gentleman, Jan Asman, is maybe the greatest Egyptologist of all. He's retired now, but that hasn't stopped him writing about a book a week. And he was originally a professor in Heidelberg. And years ago, he wrote this book called Moses the Egyptian. He's interested in cultural memory. So I'm not trying to prove historical figures or archaeological record or anything like that. And he traces the monotheism of Moses actually back to the Egyptian 18th dynasty, which others have done before, and in fact to this king, Akhenaten, 
if you've heard about him before, Akhenaten sort of turns Egyptian religion on its ear. He declares a kind of monotheism. Some people will say that's a very superficial term and shouldn't be used. But he basically worships the sun's disk. And so you'll see he gets his own logo that never occurs at any other time in Egyptian history. It's a round circle of the sun's disk with the rays protruding down and ending in human hands. And so the Aten, or the sun's disk, is the focus of his religion. And he even starts hacking out the names of other hated gods who are in competition. And he and his queen, the famous Nefertiti, become sort of the focal <coughs> nexus point between the gods, or the god Aten, and the people. So whether you see this as a political move to regroup power around the king, or a genuine religious revolution and a restructuring and a monotheistic approach to what it is to be human and what it is to be alive, all of that surrounds and swirls around Akhenaten's reign. More ink has been spilled on that particular king than any other Egyptian pharaoh. So Asman goes back to Akhenaten and he says that Moses sort of, the, the, the monotheism of Moses goes back originally to Akhenaten in Egypt. And then he shows how Moses' followers denied the Egyptians any part in the origin of their beliefs and condemned them as polytheistic idolaters. And so Osman claims that's how began the cycle in which every counter-religion, by establishing itself as truth, denounced all others as false. Right? Whatever you believe, that's the true faith, and whatever anyone else believes is not working or somehow misguided. So Osman reconstructs this cycle as a pattern of historical abuse, and he tracks it from the ancient sources, including the Bible, through the Renaissance debate over the basis of religion, and even into Sigmund Freud's Moses and monotheism. So this was a pretty interesting approach, and in fact, Osman was attacked, basically, as if this were an anti-Semitic polemic, when I think instead he was really trying to focus on religion and the us and them kind of dichotomy that developed out of all of this and has led to quite a bit of violence throughout world history. So he wrote a follow-up book to Moses, uh, this one's called The Price of Monotheism. And he claims it was the Moses of the Hebrew Bible who introduced this true-false distinction in a permanent and revolutionary form. And he argues that the price of this revolution, this monotheistic revolution, has been the exclusion as paganism and heresy of everything deemed incompatible with the truth it proclaims. This exclusion has exploded over and over again into violence, persecution, and he claims with no end in sight. So, pretty, pretty strong words, pretty provocative. So, I have not given you very much archaeological evidence. The reason is there ain't none. Will something come up? I don't know. From the Egyptian sources, it's not the kind of story they're likely to tell, unless you can find it in between the lines. Of Thank you, Professor Van Williams. My pleasure. Well, you recall that Professor Kugel, in his book, discusses at some length <coughs> this uh, rationalization of miracles, which on the one hand it would seem to, whose goal is to uh, defend the integrity of sacred scripture, mm -hmm. on the other hand it fundamentally undoes it because it turns out the miracle is not a miracle, it wasn't anything special, it was just normal natural processes taking, uh, taking their natural course, which is precisely the opposite of what the Bible is trying to say, which is that these are not natural events, these were spectacularly unnatural events. So there's a paradox there that by defending scripture you're actually undermining it. Mm. Okay, so I'm going to uh, skip my discussion of the historicity of the Exodus. Uh, we've just heard, uh, fundamentally, the point being is that there is no evidence. That's, that's, that's the end of the day. That's the bottom line, right? There is no evidence. So we're left with the biblical narrative, and what we do with it, that's uh, as usual, the usual sets of issues and problems. Just to summarize the big point, <clears throat> most modern Bible scholars would argue that the narrative as we have it is not historical, Again, it's not written by a newspaper reporter chronicling events that he, she, they saw. Rather, it's a, again, it's an ideological narrative, that display of divine power. And possibly, at, at most, there was some kind of extra story that which some clans, some tribes underwent. And that story of part of the people of Israel became part of the national story of the people of Israel, suitably exaggerated, suitably embroidered, suitably embellished. It became part of the national story, but historically would have been at most a story of part of the, of the people, not all the people. That would be, I think, the standard view of modern Bible scholars, I, I believe. Yeah. Okay, but as I said many times in this class, the historicity is not important. Right, what's important is what does the text mean? What is the text trying to say? 
leaving aside questions of historicity. I think we get hung up on that, and then we don't pay attention to the really interesting things. Excuse me. At the end of the day, we don't know whether the narrative is historical or not. But I do have the narrative in front of me. And we can talk about what is the narrative trying to say, what message is it trying to give. And that's what I want to talk about right now. So, we've seen this narrative already before. God is the God of history. God controls human events. God controls natural events, reflecting his will and God's own sense sense of justice. What's very striking is that the morality, sin, punishment motif, bad guys get punished, good guys get rewarded, is not actually operative here. That is to say, why are the Israelites enslaved in Egypt? Oh, I know, I have the Joseph story, there's a famine, the Israelites come into the land of Canaan, okay, and then the new Pharaoh takes over and enslaves the, enslaves the Israelites. Why does Pharaoh enslave the Israelites? Well, Scripture gives us an, a human explanation, right, because he's afraid that the Israelites will become a fifth column, will become a dangerous element in the Egyptian society, threatening, threatening society and government. Okay, theologically, I'm asking, why does God allow this to happen? Why are the Israelites enslaved for hundreds of years in Egypt? Is it because they're wicked? Is it because their enslavement is, pun- is pun- condign punishment for their sins? Question mark, class? Anybody answer me on that one? Is it because they've been wicked and deserve punishment? No. 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 It's very mysterious. This seems to be fated, scripted. Right? God wants the Israelites to be enslaved because, 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 just because. And this goes back to Genesis 15, that in the covenant between the section, God tells Abraham that your descendants, Abraham, will inherit this land. It's not your land now. It belongs to the Canaanites, and the list of tribes is given, the Canaanite tribes. In the meantime, they're held by these Canaanite tribes. Your descendants will inherit this land, but not yet. First, they have to go to a land not their own, Egypt, and they're being enslaved for 400 years. After that, they will return here and take over this land. That's Genesis 15. Now, if I were Abraham, I would have said, God, why do my descendants have to suffer so 400 years of enslavement in a land not their own? Well, our forefather Abraham forgot to ask that question, so God gets away with it. So the Israelites are enslaved for 100 years. This is a very striking motif. I'm not quite sure what to make of it, why the narrator uh, depicts it this way, but it is a motif we will see elsewhere in the Hebrew Scriptures, where on the national level, the national, on the global level, the cosmic level, God is often depicted as acting mysteriously and as if we are controlled by fate. The fate comes from God. It's not Greek, where it's not where the fate is in opposition to Zeus. No, Faith and God are the same thing. But God often acts in mysterious ways. This is a, this is a classic example of that, of that here. Okay, so the Israelites are enslaved in Egypt for reasons known to God and God only. Uh, they're there for a long period of time, 400 years in one text, 430 years in another text, uh, 210 years according to rabbinic chronology. Uh, and then they escape with a, the exodus. And of course, we have here a spectacular display of divine power. And any of you who go to a Passover Seder know that we celebrate the ten plagues. Why do we need so many plagues? Why don't we just drop the atom bomb and get it over with? You know, why this dramatic build-up? First this, then this, then that, then this, and that. that. Finally, we get to the plague of the death of the firstborn, Until finally, 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 Pharaoh says, enough! He rapidly changes his mind, however, setting us up for the even more spectacular display of divine power at the splitting of the sea, which we, a news clip of which we saw uh, uh, previously. So why does God need all those plagues? Why doesn't God just start off with the death of the firstborn? Or as I said, just drop the atom bomb and get it over with and then leave. Well, again, the text does not answer this question. Apparently, we like the fact we have here multiple opportunities for God to display power. And indeed, according to the narrative, both the Israelites and the Egyptians alike 
need to be impressed by divine power. Both of them need to be uh, brought to their attention that this is a powerful God, you don't mess with this God. We have, this is a common motif throughout the, these plagues uh, chapters, and also in the Passover ritual, which we'll talk about in just a moment, right? The ritual about Passover, where we're told over and over again, there's a didactic function. Your child will ask you, why do we do all these things? And your reply is, because God redeemed us with a mighty arm, a mighty hand, an outstretched arm from the land of Egypt. So in Israel's historical memory, this is a formative moment. Right? This is the moment in which Israel recognizes God. And how does Israel recognize God? Answer, God puts on a spectacular sound and light show. So Israel comes to acknowledge God and God's power, and also Pharaoh. Pharaoh, too, needs to be taught that this God is a God you don't mess with. Now, what's interesting here is that the narrator wants Pharaoh to recognize God, and Pharaoh is obstreperous, Pharaoh resistant, until finally he can, cannot deny what is obvious. Namely, this is a powerful God, and he must, he must yield. Does that mean Pharaoh becomes an Israelite? Does that mean Pharaoh, by acknowledging the power of Israel's God, has, quote, converted? No, the narrator knows how to distinguish. There's a, there are Gentiles, to use a later word, there are non-Israelites who will acknowledge the power of Israel's God. And that's a good thing. But at the end of the day, they're not Israelites. <clears throat> at the end of the day, they're still polytheists. At the end of the day, the Egyptian Pharaoh is still an Egyptian Pharaoh. His Egyptian courtiers are still Egyptian. They're going to worship all their gazillion gods. I don't know how many are there, but gazillion, more or less. Many, many gods. They remain Egyptian. Here's a motif we will see again throughout the Hebrew Bible, where that the God imposes a system of morality on the world. All nations are obligated to observe this system of morality, even non-Israelites. Israelites have a special set of rules that apply only to them. But the whole series of rules apply to all of humanity, and God will punish non-Israelites also for violating those rules. And in return, God expects, God demands, that these non-Israelites will observe uh, these fundamental norms of piety, morality, and justice. In this case, combined with the recognition that these rules, in fact, come from God. It is God, the Israelite God, who is punishing, imposing the system of order. So we have a two-tier system. Israelites owe exclusive loyalty to God. Right? Israel is not allowed to sleep around, to use the marriage metaphor of the prophets. Whereas the non-Israelites, they need to recognize the power of Israel's God, and apparently that's all we expected. Okay, we'll come back to this point again in later text. We talk about, again, the prophets who critique the nations. Prophets like Isaiah, Amos, Jeremiah, they're not just yelling at the Israelites, they're also yelling at non-Israelites. But the goal is not to make them into Israelites, the goal is not to make them convert, their goal, rather, is to bring them to a, an awareness of the demands of morality and justice. Okay. Exodus chapter 12. <clears throat> History of the, Pes of the Pesach, or the Passover sacrifice. This is our first legal text class, chapter 12. It's a text full of ritual rules and laws, generally speaking, ascribed to P, uh, our, our, our priestly source. What's going on in the Passover sacrifice? Remember, you, well, if you watch the movie The Ten Commandments, right, you slaughter a lamb, you uh, sprinkle the blood on the doorposts of your house, tent dash tent, you huddle inside while the destroyer, that's the word used, the destroyer is out loose, killing the firstborn of the Egyptians. So there is no Egyptian house that does not have a dead in it. It says, Ain't by the share, ain't shamate, there is no house without a corpse, except among the Israelites who are protected by the blood of the Paschal sacrifice. That's the story. That's what it says. Now, what is going on in this story uh, is very hard to fathom or detect. Uh, our assumption is that this lurking beneath this all is an apotropaic set of rituals. Apotropaic, another nice word, right? A ritual is designed to avert danger. 
turn back danger, to be protective. Avert is Latin, apotropaic is Greek, means the same thing. Turning back, turn, turning aside. So behind the story of the death of the Egyptian firstborn and the saving of the Israelite firstborn is the power of the blood, the power of the blood of the Paschal Lamb. Surely, lurking deep beneath the subterranean chambers here, is some kind of substitution. Once upon a time, we sacrificed our firstborn. Remember the Akeda story, Genesis 22. We don't do that anymore. God still attacks the firstborn. There's something lurking here on, on, on that score, where the behind the Passover ritual and the blood manipulation, the slaughter of the lamb, we slaughter the lamb because we don't slaughter the firstborn. Anyway, this is, a, this is the way it's commonly understood. The text gets very complicated, though, with trying to mix in both the historical setting in Egypt, at the same time combining it with a seven-day matzah festival. Matzah festival to eat unleavened bread in the spring. What does that have to do with the blood uh, of the manipulation and the protection of the firstborn? Well, the text tries to connect them. The Israelites were in a big hurry. They had to leave Egypt in a big hurry. They didn't have time for the bread to rise. You know, if you set your bread machine to bread, it takes typically three hours and 30 minutes to get a loaf of bread. But they didn't have time. They had to hurry up. The Egyptians were saying, go, go, go. So the Israelites had to leave in a hurry. Therefore, they had unleavened bread. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, maybe that's a satisfactory explanation for you, but most of us would say that's not. there's something else going on here. So it seems to be a combination of this sacrifice, the blood of the lamb, festival, protection of the firstborn uh, festival, combined with a seven-day spring matzah festival, and somehow these come together in some very mysterious way. Yes? Uh, there was a question about the, the nature of the firstborn. Was yes. it just firstborn males, and or were females included in this? Excellent question. The text says uh, firstborn and suggests it's males. Right, suggests it's males. I believe there is some discussion in the rabbinic midrash about this point. What if the house does not have a firstborn male? Well, then you get to firstborn, but ultimately they, they think would be a firstborn female also. But that's the rabbinic reading. I believe the text would strongly suggest it's a firstborn male. The, the, the question was posed further. What if the daughter is older than the son? That's not a firstborn male. I'm just going by what it says, right? Uh, right. I, I have no inside information here, except that that's what it says. Right. So this, this sounds like it's male. Okay, good question. I don't have a full answer to that one. Read the text carefully and see whether you think firstborn females would have been included. I think they would have been, as females generally were, invisible in that culture. Okay, one minute left. Exodus 15, Song of the Sea. Spectacular song, just as like Genesis 49, where our assumption is that the narrator has before him an old song, which is a freestanding, independent composition, which is inserted into the narrative. The story is a story, and then we have this poem which antedates the story, and in some extent may even be inconsistent with the story. Right? That, that's what we have in, in Exodus 15, the Song of the Sea. It is a spectacular song. If you read it very carefully, and Kugel, very few people argue that it's not entirely consistent with the prose narrative that precedes it. That, of course, it depends on interpretation. You can make it consistent if you want to make it consistent. If you don't want to, of course, the song seems to be an alternative version of the events described in the previous chapter. Okay, everybody, our time is up. Uh, have a great, uh, great weekend, and thank you again, Professor Ramiolia.